there. <laughs> you know, this your business is, card. You know, this is a <laughs> gift card that's zip tied on it's there. Ghetto. That's a, I was looking around like, how can I put a This was on not really supposed to be for interviews. This was supposed like to be for fun stuff. Like All right, well, I've been trying to find Phil for a week and a half, and it's the night before the race, and we found out that he might be right in here in this trailer, finish line IV therapy. So let's go in and. Uh, what a better time to do an interview when he's locked down in a chair, can't get up because he's got an IV. Because I've been literally chasing him for four days. So I think he's in here. Let's go see. All right, so we're sitting here with uh, Phil Blurton from No Limit. And uh, this is his uh, pre-race kind of uh, conditioning. Uh, you're getting an IV here, Phil. What are, you, what are you trying to do here? Trying to hydrate? Yeah, for sure, you know, been in the desert all day and you're pre-run all day and you're not drinking enough fluid, so this kind of just keeps you 100% all day. The thing I'm trying to figure out is uh, in the past I've seen you doing your kind of pre-race stuff in the morning. You seem to throw up a lot uh, before you race, so if you pre-hydrate and then you throw up, does that like, is that like a double negative? I think it's kind of like an equalizer. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you add it in, you get rid of it, and then you're still balanced. Yeah. But I, I think you told me the other day that you kicked that habit. You're not uh, getting an upset stomach anymore, which means you're probably a confident, comfortable race car driver, right? And we get, uh, what do we get in the IV that calms my stomach? Uh, we give you Zofran that calms your stomach down. Yeah, Zofran. Oh, so you got Zofran. Uh, that's calming fluid. So uh, up there in Alta, they call it Alta Bama. They do um, Kessler and Mountain Dew. They call that warming fluid, not calming fluid. You ever tried that? Don't even know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the best. But, but anyway, uh, this is a pretty good example. Uh, you know what you got to do here. The car's ready. Your crew's ready. Uh, you just went through tech, and uh, you're just relaxing. It's 5 o'clock, uh, night before the race. Um, going to get hydrated and probably go to bed early, unlike some other people. Are you going to go to bed early? I'll definitely go to bed early, but first, uh, Steve brought us some Wagyu steaks, so they're on the barbecue right now. So, so your pit is very similar to uh, Eric's pit in that you guys are never unfed. No, no, for sure. I brought a refrigerator full of food, and I haven't even opened it yet, and these guys have been feeding us the whole time. So that's one thing about uh, your guys' camp is that three meals a day, the best food, uh, clean, and you're all business. There's no partying there's no staying up late you came down here to do a job and and you're going to do that job right yeah for sure um one meal a day for me though i can't eat i can't eat with a, or i can't pre-run with a full stomach and i won't race with any food in me either i don't know if you noticed but i eat three meals a day <laughs> my my diet on race day is a pe like two peach rings one per lap and a little beef jerky did you say a peach ring peach ring hmm. um when I race with Yoder, he takes um, two cans of Copenhagen and duct tapes them to the roof of the car, and that's his lunch. <laughs> no, that's a pretty good plan, I guess. <laughs> Where's the spit go? Right in the helmet? Well, the problem with us is uh, sometimes we take the helmets off during the race. Oh, yeah. um, but uh, we also have the Swedish fish, too. You ever had any of those? Yeah, here's the bunk part. I brought some Swedish fish, but I got them at Walmart, and they're like a knockoff one, and they're horrible, so they're not going in the race car. Why is it that, that race car drivers, like, this is a staple. Like, I've never had a Swedish fish, which I don't even, are they from Sweden? I've never had one. And then a, a lot of race car drivers have Swedish, sweet, how do you even say that? I don't know. See, I used to, one time I was like, oh, I'm going to have a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. So we cut it up into little cubes, you know, thinking it would be nice. And when I went to put it in my helmet, the peanut butter <laughs> smeared all over the front of my helmet. So then I just went straight candy after that. <laughs> it, it, like... You know, if your mother doesn't let you eat candy at home, then why is it that when you're riding in a race car for 12 hours and exerting all of your energy, that it's okay to eat candy? I don't know. You'd have to ask Cassie that one. Cassie, our kids get candy, and like I'm like, where'd the candy go? I go to have some thrown out every day. You know, my kids, we, we have our Halloween candy. It's still on the top of the fridge. They don't even eat it. I don't know what they have, like, one, and that's it. If I can't reach it. It's on the top of the fridge. <laughs> I can reach it. It's, I'm, I'm, I'm like three pounds in, you know, it's almost gone from Halloween. Um, so you have any other rituals you're going to do tonight before you get ready for the race? Mm. Yeah. Oh yeah. I don't really have, I don't have a nighttime ritual now before the race. So, um, 
you know, you had a, a little bit of a rough day there uh, uh, on the desert race, and uh, now that's behind you, and it's time to just go uh, get it handled. What, what position do you qualify? Sixth position. But today we had a little bit of a rough day, too. We went to go practice sledge, and I did it like three times, and on the fourth time, I was upside down for about 30 minutes. I broke the front shocks off the car, the drive shaft, and it was just Bo and I there, and we were trying to figure out how to winch the car back over. So we drug it down the hill for about 40 feet until it finally went back over, and that was the end of our pre-run day. I didn't want to say anything because I did walk by the car in your pits, and I did uh, see a bent trailing arm, the side smash, the shock shooting oil out of it. Um, so you pretty much got that one out of the way, huh? Yeah, we definitely realize that we'll winch sledge in the race right there. We'll take the time, but we'll hop out, winch it, and go. And what that was going down sledge? Up sledge. Oh, up sledge. Up, yeah. Up the plaque line. That, where was that? Up the plaque line. And then did you did you go right up the ledge where the plaque is, or did you try and side surf around? <laughs> well, the side surfing is what got me on my roof. <laughs> So there will be no side surfing. That's that's a winch line. I mean, five minutes winch, you're in, you're up, you're, he's back in the car, and out you go. I mean, that's just a safe move. Yeah. UTV class, we have the option. We can go jackhammer or sledgehammer. 4,400, they go one one lap, one the other lap. But we get when we get to the bottom of jack and sledge, all that we have to do is get to the mailbox any direction we want to go. And you and I both know that sledge is a much shorter distance point to point with really one big obstacle um and jack has quite a few obstacles and you have to go way up and around and down and i heard they have some sort of a bonus cutoff line on jack where you could really get in trouble yeah we walked the uh, bonus line yesterday and bo said he's not riding with me if we go on that side hill so well he's your co-driver so if he's not riding with you then that's pretty much out of the race plan if you go there i'm getting out of the car I tried to meet up with you up there in Loomis, and uh, like everybody else, I could go by their shop, and their cars were all torn apart, and any time I could stop by and spend some time with you with them, but your cars were packed up early. You were just finishing up uh, your last car, and you didn't have any time because you've been down here, what, a week or so? Two weeks. So that is a full commitment. You've been down here for a week, or for two weeks since the first pre-ran everything, uh, entering the desert race and the rock race, um, and then doing all your PR stuff. So uh, you are sponsored by who? Can-Am, Monster, BF Goodrich, uh, Vision. There's a lot of stuff. We're just reading We're just reading the shirt. Steve, Steve Hansen, Hansen Trust, yeah. Um, so I don't the, have a WFO sponsorship. What's that? <laughs> no WFO sponsorship. Damn it, no WFO sponsorship. So I get a gift card though. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is going the wrong direction. All right, so let's let's back up to when you were 16 years old and uh, I first met you. Where were you when I first met you? On the light pole. Yeah, you were flexing your 1985 Toyota pickup uh, on the light pole in the high school parking lot. And I think you had big blue. I had, or maybe the blazer. Was it big blue or the blazer? No, I had big blue. Yeah, and I, and I saw Phil, and I said, "Oh, we're looking up a seat. Yeah, you, you need some more." <laughs> so anyway, I saw you flexing out on the light pole, and I said, "This kid looks like he knows what he's doing." And uh, I went over, and I think I offered you a job that day, right? Yeah, I think uh, John Savoy, yeah. right? You guys were coaching football. Uh huh. I met you there, and then I came in to do my senior project. We did a gear set in my third member. So you did your senior project, and then we said, well, you know, after school, you can come over and, you know, mess around at the shop, and that's what you did, right? I pretty much did my senior project and didn't leave. So you really weren't there very long, but in the time that you were there, you learned a lot of stuff. And I know that um, uh, you started doing CAD design, you learned how to weld, um, and then Bo helped you on a lot of the engineering stuff. And you remember how many years you were there? Mm, three years. That's what I think about three years. And, and the Toyota morphed from this little tiny, tiny Toyota to one tons, 44-inch Super Swampers back there in the day. Yep. And we built my Super Duty there, too. And we took your brand new 05 diesel Super Duty, chopped it up in the shop, and put 41-inch uh, IROC radials on it. King, co King Coilover's front and rear. Yep. 
you did it, right? Yeah, linked it front and rear. I remember I bought that thing. I was like the first thing I ever financed. I took it straight there. Cut yeah, how old do you think you were when you financed that truck? 18. So 18 years old, buys a brand new Ford F-250 diesel. You never missed a payment. You were working. You were making money. You were a hardworking guy. And what, in the first month, you cut it up? I remember I, dro- I bought it, drove it to the dealer, or drove it to the airport, flew to SEMA, looked at a bunch of stuff at SEMA, came back, and we cut it apart. It had 490 miles on it when we cut it apart. And then once we were done cutting it apart, putting the tires, putting the link in it front and rear, what did we do after that? Burnout. No, where'd we, where'd we take it? The, so the first time I ever came down here was with you. Oh, yeah. I guess we towed down here, huh? We came down here for uh, Tin Bender's Jamboree. Yeah, we came down here, I think, in about 04. Oh, oh, it would, be, would have been 04. Oh, we came with Tom and all those guys that trip. We came down with Tom Ways and Huss and stuff, but maybe it was like 06. But anyway, uh, we brought your F-250. We towed your Toyota down here, um, ran just about all the trails. My phone's ringing. <laughs> it's no big deal. Let's see. Oh, it's my daughter. <laughs> that was a slight intermission while you got the uh, the extra juice, you know. <laughs> NAD. Um, okay, so let's fast forward. I've been down to the hammers with you. You were driving a, a rig with uh, leaf springs and 44-inch super swampers, and I think max speed was, what, 25 in the desert? Probably. What, it had a single 5.0 case in it? Yeah. So now you're down here, um, and you're racing UTV uh, Pro Turbo class, and... Uh, you've been racing UTV for quite a long time. We stopped by your shop. We saw a lot of your trophies, and my phone will not stop ringing. Okay. <laughs> um, and you've been in a lot of races. So what are some of the, the races that you've won? Uh, Just go down the list or what? Okay, I'll go down the list a little bit. So uh, three Vegas to Reno in a row. Four, four Vegas to Reno in a row. Um one little one, the Baja 1000. Four, four YouTube World Championships. Okay. What else? Mm, yeah, score overall champion, maybe three best in the desert championships. Mm, three Silver State 300 wins. And these have all been in Can Am? All Can Am. All Can Am. So um, you've been with Can Am for a long time, and all those wins are great. Baja 1000. But uh, I would say, like, the Great White Buffalo, uh, the win that I've always wanted to see you get because your route started in rock crawling would yeah. be king of the hammers. Yep. Yeah, I kind of I realized this year that my rock crawling roots have almost held me back at hammers because the UTV is so momentum-based where I always tried to finesse through everything like you would in a normal, like, solid axle rock crawler. Um, but you know, can am we spend a bunch of time with all the other teammates down here and like you really in the side by side, it's, there's no drive shafts to hit. So it's a full belly skid. So you just can literally skid plate everything and just momentum through all of it. So uh, I guess I'll tell you tomorrow if that works. Yeah, tomorrow we'll see what happens. So you, I get what, I get what you're saying is that you're, you've been rock crawling so much that you think you need to finesse it, but the real deal is, uh, keep the momentum up and just send it. So what are what are your some? Uh, I mean, you've raced King of the Hammers, I think, four times, right? Yep, four four King of the Hammers. I guess. Well, I've ridden with Rick Waterbury. I've ridden with Eric. I rode with Andy. And these these were all in forty four hundred and forty eight hundred cars. You've been a co driver, right? Yep. And then I've raced myself four times, and we've got two thirds, and I think a seventh and an eighth. Yeah. So in UTV, two thirds, a seventh, and an eighth, and. Every one of those races, you were setting down a really fast pace, and it's always some little thing that, some little hiccup that comes up, right? Yeah, I mean, we've always been like right in the very front of the pack on the first lap and going into the rocks, and then just been kind of small issues. Last year, we had a bunch of big issues. Um, hit a rock really hard, broke like a knuckle in half, and just kind of a day of just the pit crew working on the car every day or all the time. Um, the year before when we got third, it was just one flat tire that took us out. Uh, which that's and that's crazy. Such such a long race, one flat tire. How long does it take you guys to change the tire? Uh, maybe a minute and 20 seconds or something. Yeah, and just like that, this race is that competitive that a small thing like that can take you out of the race, right? I've been talking to a lot of the other guys, and, you know, 
your your stats show that you have the skill level you've won a ton of races you know how to drive you understand the car you build the cars yourself but you know part of the king of the hammers race there is a a, a little piece of the puzzle that's luck right no there's no luck in racing i like that answer i like that answer so um and then in the desert race, same thing, just one little kickoff to the side. Um, this year you had an axle shaft go, right? Yeah, we ran a 35-inch tire, so it put a little bit more load. We, we can't typically run a 35-inch tire in all the other series that we race. Um, but the ruts got so deep here we and we're allowed to that we ran it here. And, yeah, just a fluke deal, broke a rear axle going up a hill. We've never broke a rear axle in a desert race before. And then what size tires are you running on your car tomorrow? 35-inch tire as well, same exact tire, a sticky 35 BFG. Yeah, so um, you know, tomorrow it's it's there is no taking your time and calculating like you're going to leave that starting line and you're going to be going for it, right? Yeah, everybody's like, oh, the desert's going to break people out. You got to be careful and you can pace yourself in the rocks. No, you, and you have to go hard the whole day. And I, I think that's the the competition is so high now. I think that people don't understand that you can't set a nice pace. And win anymore like we used to think that was the thing and it's not anymore is it yeah no you can't work on the car you can't do anything and the um the desert loop is so fast luckily we, we've done it what four times now and but we're running it opposite direction of what we ran it before but uh but yeah i don't want to i want to be in the front of i want to be the first car into the rocks well uh hopefully uh everything goes good for you tomorrow and i know that you have a huge pit crew with you. They work their ass off. They go all over the all over the country with you and out of the country. Um, how many guys do you bring down to help you out? I think we have like 14 pit crew members for this race. Kevin, your number one guy is my. Main so guy. Kevin, uh, I I think I called him your crew chief, but whatever he is, he's like your number one. He's there um, with Josh and a bunch of other guys. Um, and then you got your co-driver Bo Judge. Like he's kind of like your ride or die, right? You guys. Your minds, uh, you know, work alike, right? Yeah, Bo's ridden every single race with me, except for when we raced the 1,000, then Chris Williams would ride with me. But otherwise, Bo's been from, I mean, before we had a Can-Am deal, Bo's been there from the very beginning. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, but most of your pit crew have been with you for a really long time. So uh, when we stop by your pit, everything's working like a well-oiled machine. There's a schedule every day. Um, you know, everything's organized. Everybody has a job and they're doing it. And there's no screwing around. You're here to do a job. Yeah, for sure. I think, I think Kevin, the first time he pitted for me was maybe at King of the Hammers down here helping some other guys. And then he's pretty much stuck along. He comes to the shop and packs all the chase trucks and gets a list for everybody down here he'll most of the time do all my fuel strategy all that for me and you know i mean how many trucks and trailers and rigs did you bring down here into your camp 30 <laughs> i don't know so like 30 and 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 what do you have how many how many actual uh cars do you have down here uh i know for sure too right because your desert car and your rock car but how many other ones do you bring down for support mm, we have four can ams down here yeah, so basically two of them to uh, pre-run and practice on and two race cars. Yeah, my pre-runner is nice. It's a, it's an exact replica of my race car this year. So I have two of matching cars. Um, and yeah, I have a backup pre-runner, just a more stock car. We have the Can-Am Defender, which is like a cab car that we can cruise around the pits. Uh, my desert car, which is it's already loaded up in the stacker and ready to go home and get prepped for the Mint 400 right after this. Yeah, that's what people don't understand is like you are... A professional race car driver so king of the hammers is just one race how many races do you do in a year mm, we're gonna do 10 races this year last year the races were so stacked that i actually had somebody come down and pick up my desert car and bring it home so i could start getting prepped while we were still down here racing so you guys are just full, full bore all the time so anyway uh i think that's about it and hopefully the next time i see you it'll be coming across the finish line phil oh you're hope so just